Well, if you'll turn in your Bibles to uh, Matthew chapter 7, we're going to, like Paul said earlier, we're going to continue in our Sermon on the Mount series, part 9, and I'm starting, I'm doing about half of Matthew chapter 7 tonight, covering a lot of good stuff tonight, don't know how, any idea how I'm going to get through it. I think I could spend a, a couple, uh, you could do a couple sermons on each part that I'm going to do, but I'm excited Um, about uh, this tonight. Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 1. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It says, Do not judge others, and you will not be judged, for you will be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. And why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? Hypocrite. First, get rid of the log in your own eye. Then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. Don't waste what is holy on people who are unholy. Don't throw your pearls to pigs. They will trample the pearls, then turn and attack you. Keep on asking, and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking, and you will find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives. Everyone who seeks finds. And to everyone who knocks, the door will be open. You parents, if your children ask for a loaf of bread, do you give them a stone instead? Or if they ask for a fish, do you give them a snake? Of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask him? Do unto others whatever you would like them to do to you. This is the essence of all that is taught in the law and the prophets. You can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad and its gate is wide for many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow and the road is difficult. Only a few ever find it. So we're going to cover these first 14 verses here. Let's talk about verses 1 through 6 about not judging others and uh, being measured, (laughs) being judged. We will be judged by the measure in which we judge. Um, In in this part here, verses 1 through 6, Jesus is telling us to examine our own motives and conduct instead of judging other people. That's what it is. Basically, what he's telling us here. Um, It's so key that we judge ourselves before we judge others. It's so key. It's not in here that he's telling us not to judge other people. He's saying, get the the log out of your eye before you go after the speck in somebody else's eye. Um, It's so easy for us to be critical. And actually, this word judge here, if you do a word study, it's actually translated to being critical is what it's talking about. But it's so easy for us to be critical of others and their small faults while we many times become blind to our own faults, right? It's easy to be critical of everybody else's faults, but it's sometimes hard to see our own faults. And that's what Jesus is saying here. Look at your own faults. Look in the mirror. Look in the mirror. We're, we're not to judge quickly. We're not to judge rashly. We're not to judge without knowing other people's intentions. We don't know people's hearts. Only God knows the heart of a person. Only he can see the inside of a person. And many times it's easy for us to judge people by just a single act, we, ju- we sometimes we, we, we put a scarlet letter on people from one mistake they make and we judge them by that one mistake for the rest of their life. Or we have a, we have a bad first impression with somebody and we, we, we initially, we put a mark on them and we forever are critical of that person because we had a bad first time with them. We had a bad first meeting with them. We had a bad first impression with them. And we don't, but we didn't, we didn't know their heart. We were just being critical of that person. That's what Jesus is telling us. To, don't do that. Don't judge a man by just one, this one single act that he did. We don't know the heart. We don't know the motive. So we have to be careful about being critical of others. In John 7, 24, Jesus says, look beneath the surface so that you can judge correctly. Look beneath the surface so that you can judge cor- correctly. And he was actually saying this to the Pharisees in response for them being critical of him healing someone on the Sabbath day. He was like, hold up. And he actually tells them, you would circumcise your kid on the Sabbath day because you would be obeying the law. But technically, you'd be breaking the Sabbath if you did circumcise your kid on the Sabbath day. And so he, he was getting on it. And you're getting mad at me for healing somebody on the Sabbath day. And so you're being critical. You're judging someone. You have no idea what my heart and what my intentions are. And so he says, look beneath the surface before you make a judgment. And so when we come into contact with people, it's good that we look beneath the surface of what's going on. Whenever I come in contact with someone that, is, that treats me wrongly or, or doesn't treat me the way that I would like them to treat me, that is rude to me or cusses me or handles me in, a, in the wrong way, I always then need to remember this and step back and say, hang on, I don't know what's going on at their house right now. I don't know what's going on in their family 
I don't, you know, maybe they just lost a loved one recently, or maybe they're going through a struggle, maybe they're going through a hard time, maybe something awful is happening in their life right now, and so I cannot be critical or judgmental of this person because I had one bad moment with them. <clears throat> and that, that is hard because when people come at me, I want to come right back. Like that's just my, I, what, to whatever level they're at, I want to elevate up to what they, where, where they are right then. But we have to be careful. We have to respond with grace, humility, and the love of God. It, the last thing when somebody, and especially when somebody's dealing with something, the last thing they need to come in contact with is a critical judgmental spirit. They need to come in contact with the grace and humility and love of God. We've got to see rightly before we cast judgment. And, and, and even in this, many times, many times we are the most judgmental of other people, of faults that we see in them that we also have. Many times, like, what frustrates us about others <laughs> is what we are actually subconsciously frustrated with ourselves about. This happens all the time. We get really critical of other people, and, and things that bother us about others is actually what bothers us about the most about ourselves. You know, I went through a season last year where I was getting really irritated and really critical of people who I thought were prideful, and I was getting really frustrated, and I was, I was, going, to the, I was going to the Lord, and just like, God, they are Man, they are so prideful, like, rem like, Lord, remove them, especially with Christian people who I thought were being prideful. And I was like, God, I, like, I can't take this. Like, this makes me mad. I, don't, I, like, I can't even talk to them. I can't be around them. I don't want to watch them. I don't want to be with them. And then the Holy Spirit came to me and whispered, you're full of pride. And I went through this, and then I went through this season of the Lord just working on me and my pride and stopped judging everybody else and take a look in the mirror, Josh. <laughs> Before you are critical of other people, take a look in the mirror and you need to judge yourself rightly because what is bothering you about them is worse. It's worse on the inside of you right now. You actually don't know the motive and intentions of your heart, but he came to me and he said, I know the motives and intentions inside of your heart that you don't even know about yourself. And it was real, it was a real slap in the face. Like, Lord, please. Okay. <laughs> I repent. Always, always, always look in the mirror first. Let's get the plank out of our eye before we go to our brother and sister in Christ. Before you're critical of your spouse, look in the mirror. <laughs> before you're critical of your spouse, be critical of yourself. Humble yourself. Don't come to your spouse and say, you need to work on this, 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 and this. Come to your spouse and say, baby, what can I work on? What can I work on? What are some things that you see in me that I need to do better at? Every, every couple months, I, I take Sarah out on a date, and I, and, I, and I always say, babe, how can I be better? What, what, what area am I slacking in? How can I be better? And so I'm always trying to look in the mirror and, and never being critical of her, but looking at myself and like, how can I be a better husband? I always try to humble myself. Always judge yourself first, and then lovingly forgive and help your neighbor. James 2.13 says, There will be no mercy for those who have not shown mercy to others. But if you have been merciful, then God will be merciful when he judges you. In this first part in verses 1 through 6, Je Jesus' statement here about not judging others is all about being, it's against a kind of hypocritical, judgmental attitude that is, that is interested in tearing down others and building up yourself. That, you know, when he's saying, when he says, do not judge others or, or you will not, and you will not be judged, He's not making a blanket statement about overlooking sinful behavior. That's not what he's doing. He's not making a blanket statement like, okay, don't judge at all. He's saying, he's saying, don't judge others and you will not be judged. And then he goes into, because, of, because the standard that you judge, you will also be judged. What Jesus is rather talking about is, is he's talking about rash judgments. He's talking about being critical or being fault finding or having a disposition to condemn people. He's talking about being harsh and unkind. He's talking about hypocritical judgment. He's talking about a person who is more concerned with everybody else's faults and not their own. That's what Jesus is talking about here. He's not saying don't make judgments. He's saying judge yourself first. Don't be a hypocrite. Don't be a hypocrite. The, the Pharisees were notorious for this at the time. They were always nitpick, nitpicking at, at people's actions, never knowing their heart, while they themselves were full of pride and full of lust and full of greed. Jesus called them whitewashed tombs. Why, that's what he called them. So Jesus is not forbidding judgment. He's not, 
And he's especially, he's not forbidding, forbidding private judgment. He's not forbidding reproving and correcting our brothers and sisters in Christ. We are actually to judge those inside the church. It's actually very clear in Scripture that we are to, as believers, that we are to judge one another. That we, that, okay, later in this chapter, that Pastor Tim's going to cover it next week, verses 15 to 23, is all about judging a, a tree by its fruit. It's all about judging truth. And if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and 5, the Apostle Paul is talking about judging people who say they are believers inside of the church. He says, don't judge the world. He says, why would I judge an unbeliever? They're an unbeliever. They're not a Christian. But to somebody who says they're a Christian, here is the way that you, here is the way that you handle them. We are called to judge an one another. Now, that doesn't mean we go around being critical. It doesn't mean we go around being nitpicky. We always judge ourselves first and foremost, but we got to deal with our we got to deal with our blind spots. Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal our blind spots, remove them, and then we can accurately deal with the speck in our brother's eye. And, and church, I think it's important that you have some people that will speak into your life. I think it's important that you have people that you communicate permission to them to judge you. I've got I've got two close friends on staff, Brandon and Jason. Brandon Tryon, our worship leader that was up here, and then Jason Ross, our kids pastor. They at any time can pull me aside and say, hey, Josh, what you're doing here doesn't line up with the convictions that you say that you believe. They, at any time, they have permission at any time, and I have told them, no matter how much it hurts me or cuts on me, I will always humbly and gracefully receive it. And Jason actually took me out to lunch a few weeks ago, and he sat me down. And he said, hey, man, you're doing this, and I know that you don't want to do this. You're acting this way, and I know that you believe that it's wrong. And so he began to, he began to cut on me, and, you know, my natural reaction is to become offended. That's my friend, and he's talking about something. But better are wounds from a friend than kisses from an enemy. Better are wounds from a friend than kisses from an enemy. And I always tell my teenagers this. If everybody around you is just giving you kisses all the time and approving of you and telling you how awesome you are, you might be surrounded by enemies and not friends. Because friends will cut us. Friends will wound us in a loving way to help us be better. And so I've got two guys in my life, they can come to me anytime and judge me. They can come to me anytime. But do you know what they do? Do you know what Jason did before he began to cut into me? He said, hey man, is there anything I need to work on? Is there anything that you see in my life that I need to work on? And that's how it always goes between the three of us. And that iron sharpens iron. That's how we're supposed to be as brothers and sisters, that we don't get offended at our brothers and sisters, but we take their criticism, we take their judgment because it comes from love. It comes from a place of love. Oh, also, and this may be good just for, <laughs> this might be some good advice uh, for us husbands out here. Um, my wife also has permission at any time to call these two men if, if, I'm never, if I'm acting a way that's selfish at home. If I'm acting in a way and it, that is detrimental to our family, and I refuse to change. My wife has permission to call them anytime. It's just, you know, just good. Like, I want to be, uh, they know that. All, my wife knows that. They know that. I've, I've told them, hey, my wife might call you one day and tell, tell you I'm being selfish, and just, you know, you need to come and rebuke me. <laughs> but it's, just, it's good accountability. It's good accountability to have friends in your life that will speak to you, that will help you continue to grow in the Lord. <laughs> it's important that we, <laughs> it's important that we show grace to people. Like we, it's so weird because when we blow it, we always want to receive lots of grace, right? I do, maybe it's just me. But when we blow it, we always want to receive lots of grace and mercy from other people. But then when, when it's the other person that blows it, we're quick to not have grace and mercy for them, right? right, right? Like I, so it's like, I want to receive grace, but when you blow it, like, man, I'm going to lay into you right now. Right? That's, that's the easy thing to do. And so just always put yourself in that place of, okay, if I was the one that had blown it, I would want to receive grace and mercy right now. And that, that is good, constructive judgment that, that will happen in the church. Ephesians 4, 31 through 32 says, Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. So Jesus is making it clear in this passage. You can, go ahead and, you can go ahead and judge by a certain standard, but just know that you're also going to be judged by me at the standard that you hold other people up to. This is a foundational principle in God's kingdom. You reap what you sow. And so as much as you're judgmental, that's how much you're going to be judged. 
You, re- you reap what you sow. Romans 2, 1 says, you may think you can condemn such people, but you are just as bad and you have no excuse. When you say they are wicked and should be punished, you are condemning yourself. For you who judge others do these very same things. So we got to be careful that we, are not being, that we are not being hypocrites, that we're not judging other people for the same things that we're doing. The last verse in this, verse, verse 6 here, says, I love the New King James Version. It says, don't give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under, under their feet and turn and tear you into pieces. That is intense, man. <clears throat> um, I, I find it fascinating here. Uh, the word translated to holy here in the Aramaic is almost identical to earrings. Almost identical to earrings. Why do I say that? Because the very next line says, don't throw your pearls before the swine. And so it almost looks like it says, don't put your, don't put your earrings on a dog. Now, I know some of y'all dress your dogs up, and it's, it's weird. All right? It's weird, okay? You, if you put clothes on a dog, I think it's odd, but, you know, to each their own, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but, but because he says, don't put, it's, all, it's cool, don't put your earrings on a dog, don't cast your per, per, pearls before the swine. In this, earrings and pearls are symbols of spiritual truths given to us by God. They're spiritual truths given to us by God. They give us beautiful ears to hear his voice and impart lovely pearls of wisdom from God. I think that's, that's fascinating to me. I think it's really cool. We are not to regard these as lightly or share them with those who, whose hearts are closed to them. That is what this is saying, that these spiritual things that we have, that we hear in our ears and that we impart into our life, he's saying don't put them before somebody who, whose heart is hard, whose heart is not going to receive them. And also that word, that, that Aramaic word for throw is almost identical to teach or instruct. So don't throw your pearls before the swine. Almost, almost looks like it says don't teach your pearls to the swine. Don't, it's almost the value of wisdom is not appreciated by those who have no ears to hear it. The value of wisdom is not appreciated to those who have no ears to hear it. That's why I believe that one of Jesus's, one of his most repeated phrases is, he who has ears, let him hear. He who has ears, let him hear. He who has ears, let him hear. He said that many times, and the ones who didn't want to get it, he just let them go. He just let them go. He didn't chase them down and debate them. Debate has never saved anybody. You cannot argue someone into salvation. You cannot argue someone into salvation. It is a move of the Holy Spirit. Don't feel like you have to go around debating people all the time. You are not the Savior of the world. Jesus Christ is. The Holy Ghost is the one who beckons the heart of man. You preach the gospel. Some people are going to reject it. You just keep on going. You keep on moving. You love them. You show grace to them. But debate isn't going to win them over. And I'm honestly, I'm way past debate. And I think this is one reason Paul said in 1 Corinthians 4.20 that the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, it's a matter of power. It's a matter of power. One of my favorite verses in the Sermon on the Mount is the very end where it says all the people were amazed by the authority in which Jesus taught in. So it wasn't even like something that Jesus said. I love that last verse, by the authority that he taught in. The kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, it's a matter of power. It's a matter of the authority that you walk in. So don't get into fruitless arguments. Next part, verses 7 through 11 is talking about effective prayer. Effective prayer. Verses 7 and 8 says, keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. Everyone who seeks finds. And everyone who knocks, the door will be open. Jesus is telling us that to persist in prayer. To per- like, keep on asking. Keep on seeking. Keep on knocking. It's, and it's, it's not about begging the Lord. It's not about begging the Lord. It's actually showing, it's actually showing the Lord that you're not going to go anywhere else but him. That we have a complete dependence on him no matter what happens. If you flip to the Luke narrative, Luke chapter 11 of the Sermon on the Mount, it talks about, it talks about a man getting up in the middle of the night and going to a friend's house and knocking on his door while he's already in bed. And he's talking about being persistent until that man gets up and brings you a loaf of bread. To, so that it's, it's showing a picture of dependence of I'm not leaving here until I get what I came for. I'm not leaving here until I get what I came for. God answers the prayers of those who really want it. Those who will really go after it. Not, 
God isn't, his power isn't drawn to flippant, half-hearted prayers. His power is drawn to those who will go after him with all that they are. And he's going to answer prayers that align with his will. And so, so sometimes he wants us to be persistent in prayer because he's working on us to get our desires to line up with his desires. He will give you the desires of his heart when, when your desires are his desires. Because sometimes we ask for things that will destroy us. Sometimes we ask for things that will destroy us. You may want to win the lottery, but the Holy Spirit might be praying that you don't need to because it might destroy you. Now, you know, I'm praying like, Lord, I really want a million dollars. And it says that the Holy Spirit, that our spirit and the Holy Spirit under the Holy Spirit communes with God the Father. And I'm praying for a million dollars and the Holy Spirit is going, God, don't give him a million dollars. God, don't, he's not ready for it. <laughs> don't give this man a million dollars, right? <laughs> Money fixes a lot of things, but it doesn't fix everything. Money fixes a lot of things, but it, uh, money can't fix a broken heart. Money can't fix a lack of character. And so sometimes you're praying for financial breakthrough, but that financial breakthrough might destroy you. And so in his good, God doesn't answer some of our prayers in his goodness because they're not prayers that we need to be praying. And I think he wants us to keep on asking and keep on seeking and keep on knocking until our will lines up with his will. And his will is heaven on earth. His, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so many times through the process of persisting in prayer, we become a lot more like him and we begin to desire the things that he desires. And that's when we begin to see breakthrough. That's when we begin to see breakthrough. And you know, it's called breakthrough for a reason. It's called breakthrough for a reason. Anybody believing for breakthrough tonight? Believing for something? Anybody experienced awesome breakthrough before? Yes, amen, okay? It's called breakthrough for a reason. Now, I want you to know, just because the door is closed doesn't mean that it's a no. Just because there is a door that is closed doesn't mean that it is a no. It may mean that you haven't knocked. It might be a door that the Lord wants you to go through and the devil came and he shut it. And what your prayers are going to do is they're going to break it open. Right? That was a good point, Josh. Thank you for that. <laughs> that's, that's why it's called breakthrough. But how many people have quit because they believe the Lord closed a door? We, I, you hear this all the time about open doors and closed doors. And I tell our young people all the time, sometimes God wants you to kick that door in off its hinges. And not every open door is an open door from the Lord. And so that's why you've got to ask and seek, and he will put the right door in front of you for you to knock on. A closed, door may, a closed door might be a no from him, but it also might be the enemy trying to close a door to your destiny. The enemy is always trying to close doors to our destiny. A closed door may be a no from him, and he'll make it clear in time as you ask, seek, and knock. James 4.2 says, you want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it, so you fight and wage war to take it away from them. Yet you don't, you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. You don't ask God for it. I love, verse 8 is our assurance. It's our assurance. Everyone who asks receives. This, this verse should build up our faith so much. Everyone who asks receives. Everyone who seeks finds. Everyone who knocks, the door is open to them. That is, that's our assurance right there. You will be answered. You will find. The door will be opened. We have the assurance of an answer. Philippians 4, 6 says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Deuteronomy 4, 29, but, but from there you will search again for the Lord your God. And if you search for him with all your heart and soul, you will find him. Verses 9 through 11, he continues on prayer here. He talks about your, your parents. If, if your children ask for a loaf of bread, you don't give them a stone. If they ask for a fish, you don't give them a snake. If you know how to good gifts, how much more does your heavenly Father know how to give good, good gifts? And I would say the assurance that our prayers are going to be answered is because we have a good Father. The assurance of our prayers being answered is we have a good Father. 
He treats his children as a good and wise earthly parent would. He actually treats his children way better than a good and wise earthly parent would. No kind parent would mock his kid by answering his cry for bread with stones. He's a good father who desires to bless his children. Notice, though, the children are asking for what? Bread and fish. Needs. Needs. Not necessarily wants. Needs. That's what they're asking for is needs. Luke, uh, I, again, I love the Luke narrative, Luke eleven thirteen, where it says where it says good gifts in Matthew, and Luke eleven thirteen, he says, how much more will he give his Holy Spirit to his children who ask him? How much more will he give it? So he replaces good gifts with Holy Spirit because Holy Spirit is the best gift that we get. Holy Spirit is the best gift to get. Holy Spirit is heaven's greatest blessing. And how much more will he give the Holy Spirit? That means there is a greater measure of the Holy Spirit to he who asks for it. There's a greater measure of the Holy Spirit to he who asks for it. Ephesians 5.18 says, continually be filled with the Spirit. It's not a a one-time thing. And he actually parallels it in Ephesians 5.18 as don't be drunk with wine, but instead be filled with the Spirit. Because if you get drunk with wine, you don't stay drunk. Just like the Spirit is in you, but you don't stay filled with him. It's, he's created this to where we have, a, we have to depend on him. We don't get filled one time. We continually get filled with the Holy Spirit. So it's a continual of asking. If you ask him to fill you with the Spirit, he is a good father and he will fill you with the Spirit. Again, as we get closer to him and grow in relationship with him, his desires will become our desires and we'll begin asking for the right things. <clears throat> Last point here. Verse 11. Christ here, again, is revealing the heart of the Father to us. God is not selfish. He is not begrudging. He is not stingy. We don't have to come begging or groveling as we come with our request because he is a loving Father who understands, cares, and comforts. And if we as humans can be kind parents, imagine how much great of a kindness he can give to us. One of my favorite scriptures in the New Testament, Ephesians 3.20. Never doubt God's mighty power to work in you and accomplish all this. He will achieve infinitely more than your greatest request, your most unbelievable dream, and he will exceed your wildest imagination. He will outdo them all for his miraculous power constantly energizes you. I love that. More than your greatest request, more than your most unbelievable dream, he will exceed your wildest imagination. Let that build your faith in here tonight. Let that build your faith that he will exceed your wildest dreams, your wildest expectations. And many times the things that we ask for are so weak compared to what he wants to give us. He, like, let that build your faith up. This is Jesus right here telling us to pray these things, to ask him for these things, and we will be rewarded. All right, i got to finish this up. The golden rule, verse 12. Do unto others whatever you would like them to do unto you. This is basically treat others the way that you want to be treated. Our response to people is key. Everywhere and everyone. This doesn't have an asterisk next to it. Treat others the way that you want to be treated. I always try to put myself in the person's shoes that is standing in front of me. How would I feel if I, I always think, like when I go into the bank, how would I want to be treated if I was working there? So, I talk to, uh, to people who work at restaurants, and they say that Sundays are the worst days. It's the church crowd that they can't stand because they're cheap and they're rude. That we should be the most we they should be the most excited for Sunday. They should come into work they should come into work Sunday thinking I'm about to get blessed. Like I'm about to I'm about to get fat tips, man. <laughs> and I'm about to I'm about to serve the nicest people in the world. <laughs> Always put yourself in the shoes of the person that you're having that you're communicating with. Well, they treated me. Well, my food came out like this. Well, my whatever. Well, whatever. Well, I had this problem. Again, grace. You don't know what's going on in their life. You don't know what's going on in their life. Uh, Sarah and I were at a restaurant. I keep going on a rabbit trail. Sarah and I were at a restaurant. We were at Longhorns not, not too long. I think it was about a year ago. But the, the waitress, she began talking to us. And uh, it, it was her, she was having to work on her daughter's birthday. Because two weeks earlier, her husband had just left her. And we prayed for her right there at the table. I I mean, we could have been rude to her. We could have treated her just like somebody else. But she had an encounter with the power of God right at our table. 
because we were treating her the way that we would want to be treated if we were that. And I'm not saying like I'm not saying that to like brag on me. What like whatever. I'm just saying like that's testimony. We you never know what the person in front of you is going through. <clears throat> Every one of us wants to be treated with respect and kindness. The people around you want to be treated with respect and kindness. And this golden rule, it always implies action, not inaction. We are to do unto others. It's not don't do to people what you don't want done to you. It's do to other people what you want done to you. Love requires action. And again, you reap what you sow. This is a kingdom principle. You reap what you sow. Treat your spouse the way that you want to be treated. Not the way that you're treat, they're treating you. You treat them the way that you want to be treated. Treat your employees the way you wish your boss had treated you. Treat your kids the way you wish your parents had treated you. Treat your parents the way that you want to be treated. Love is the most powerful weapon that we have in the kingdom. Hearts are always changed by love and grace. And you will reciprocate the behavior from people that you show to them. All right, I'm closing. Last two verses. Narrow gate. Man, I could just preach like three sermons on this one part right here. You can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad and its gate is wide for many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow and the road is difficult and few who ever find it. The way into the kingdom is narrow. The way is narrow. The narrow way doesn't make sense sometimes. It's slower. There's no shortcuts into the kingdom. It doesn't always move as fast as you want it to, and it always puts pressure on you. It always puts pressure on you. There's a law in physics called the law of restriction. If you have a water hose and you want the water to shoot further, what do you do? Cover up part of the hole with your thumb, right? <laughs> right? Or, or you, can, you can bend it back and you can build up pressure, you put restriction on it, and then you let it go and it shoots out. Okay? The Lord comes in his goodness on our narrow way and he puts pressure on us because he is, he is wanting to launch our life farther than we ever thought possible. The narrow way, um, it doesn't mean this necessarily hard. At times it is, especially when you first start down it. But along the way, God comes and he puts his finger on something that he wants us to lay down in order for us to continue. The narrow way is referring that there's only one way to eternal life. There's only one way to abundant life. There's only one way to resurrection life. So this narrow way isn't even just talking about going to heaven one day. The narrow way is into heaven right here on earth. The narrow way is into abundant life. Jesus said the kingdom is at hand. It's at hand, but there's a narrow gate, and Jesus is that gate. He is the way into the kingdom. He is the way into the kingdom. He is the one thing that we have to surrender it all, that we have to lose it all for. And if we want to experience abundant resurrection life, if we want to experience heaven on earth, when he comes and he puts his hands on you, when he comes and touches something that he wants you to lay down, when he comes and prunes you, it's so that you can have abundant life. It's so that you can have resurrection life. And so many people don't experience the kingdom because they're unwilling to lay down those things that he puts his hands on. So many people are going to experience hell on the way to heaven because they won't lay down what he puts his hands on. When he comes and he puts his hands on something, it's so that, it's, it's so that you can have more life. The reason that the Father comes in his goodness and he begins to prune us and he begins to cut on us is so that we can bear more fruit. It's a, it feels, it, it's, it hurts, it's hard. But what he does is he comes in our immaturity as we're walking down the narrow path and he puts pressure on us and he says, you're not ready for that yet. You're not ready for that yet. You're not ready for that yet. Farmers come and they cut fruit off the trees because the tree's branches aren't strong enough to hold the fruit that they produce. And so when he comes and he cuts on you, it's actually a promotion. And it, it feels like demotion. But pruning is actually promotion in the kingdom. The narrow way is promotion into abundant life. The narrow way is promotion into abundant life. He wants to squeeze us on both sides as we walk the narrow way, but it causes all of those things weighing us down and destroying us to fall off because only we can fit. How impossible it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's like a camel going through the eye of a needle. And I would say, He wants to, the narrow way is him pulling us through the eye of a needle because he wants to completely undo us and then completely remake us. 
John chapter 4, he says, the water becomes a bubbling, gushing fountain of life. Gushing. Geysers only burst because there's pressure. But he wants to launch your life way farther than you ever thought possible. He actually puts pressure on you because he wants a better flow. (laughs) The Father knows the best way of life. That's why he puts restriction on us. Not to take life from us, but to give us the best life possible. He's the designer. He's the creator. He knows the best way that life works. And many times he comes and he asks us, he, he comes to try to take things away so that we can have more life. And why do we refuse it? Don't refuse it, lay it down. Whatever the cost, Jesus. And so we, many times, for some reason, we put such emphasis on the cost of following Jesus. But the cost is nothing compared to the inheritance. The cost, the the inheritance that I'm receiving on the other side of the narrow gate are so much better than the things that I laid down to get through the gate. When I got to the gate, my ticket had already been paid. He just said, you got to leave all that stuff out of here if you want to come in here. But when I came in here, I entered into a garden. I came into heaven on earth where I now get to walk through the cool of the day with my Father God. And so whatever he tells me to take off, I'm going to take off because he's good. Amen? Amen? Y'all stand with me. (laughs) Last thought for you. This whole sermon, the whole sermon on the mount, not my sermon, the whole sermon on the mount is all about the narrow way. Jesus is teaching people the narrow way. He's teaching people the way into the kingdom because it's the narrow way that leads to abundant life. And as you begin to judge yourself, you let go of things. As you let go of things, you begin drawing close to him, asking and seeking, and you begin to treat others the way that God would treat them, and your life starts knocking on the narrow gate, and it's opened into abundant, eternal resurrection life. Amen? God, we thank you so much for tonight. Lord, we thank you for your word. Holy Spirit, give us strength to walk through the narrow gate. Lord, right now, Just give us the heart of David that would say, Lord, come and search our hearts. Search our hearts, Lord. Put your fingers on anything that we need to lay down, on anything that we need to repent of. Come and convict us right now, Lord. Teach us how to judge ourselves, Lord, so that we we can walk into more of the fullness, Lord. Fill us with your spirit with a greater measure, God. Lord, you are so good. God, we thank you that your mercies are new every morning. We thank you that your mercies are new every morning. Lord, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that you came and that you tore the veil so that we could have access to you, so that we could always come to the Father and ask for whatever we need that we can always seek you and we can see your face, that we can always knock and you're always available, that you're always here, Lord. God, we look to you. We look to you. Teach us that your restrictions, that your laws, that your boundaries, that they're all for our good, that they're all for our gain, that they're all so that we can live in the garden with you. Lord, teach us how to bring your will to earth as it is in heaven. Go with us this week, Lord. Fill us with your spirit in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said amen and amen.